say this is where the, uh, the exhibition starts with a little bit of why he is an important person in our national story, our national consciousness, uh, why we felt we needed to do an exhibition. So one of the things that is not often uh, spoken about when talking about Paul Cuffey is that he was not African American, he was African American and Native American. And that is a really, really important part of his identity and his story. Again, often difficult to find written documentation where he's asserting that identity, but we can look to other things, right? The way he lived his life, his family networks, his relationships that really point to how important his Native identity was to him. It says he was the son of a Native American woman, Ruth Moses, and an African man, Kufe, from the African day name Kofi, and I'll explain that a little bit in the exhibition. Uh, Slocum, who was brought to this country as a slave, his father uh, became free. We're not sure if he had to purchase his freedom or if he was given his freedom, but he became free and um, had a pretty large family, though it probably wasn't large by, you know, that, uh, at that time. Um, but some of the significant things that we tell in the story about Paul Cuffey, he was the first African American, and I'll tell you why I only say African American there, the first African American to have a formal meeting with a sitting president. And so, you know, my cousin came to the exhibit opening and heard my whole thing about how important Cuffey's native identity is, and then he said, well, why do you only say African American there? And I said, yeah, it's kind of problematic, but Native Americans had sitting, uh, had formal meetings with sitting presidents, so he wouldn't have been the first Native American to do that. And so all of the things we can say about him, he was a Quaker, he was a master mariner, he was a, wa uh, a whaler, he was an entrepreneur, he was an abolitionist, he was this visionary. Um, up until 1817, he died pretty young and never got to fulfill his vision. And so now there are all these debates about what, what would have happened had he lived beyond 1817? And of course, we'll never know, but it's a, it's a good question to pose to students and, and visitors as you're touring the space. So we can come into the space. So I mentioned earlier that uh, I did a lot of work for this exhibition with Cuffey family descendants. This case here, the first case in the exhibition, is uh, it contains photographs of Paul Cuffey descendants and a couple of books written by Paul Cuffey descendants. And so many of the photographs are of uh, Horatio, his great grandson, Horatio Howard, who um, is the person who also wrote this book here, Paul Cuffey, A Self-Made Man. I realize not everyone's standing here to see it. Uh, the blue book, Paul Cuffey, A Self-Made Man, was written in tribute to his great-grandfather. Uh, there's also a book by Paul Cuffey's son. And then we have photographs of Horatio Howard at the dedication of the Paul Cuffey Memorial in 1913 in Westport. Uh, again, loaned to us by a descendant. And then some other pictures of Paul Cuffey descendants. This case here highlights uh, the two sides of his identity. So his mother's identity as a, uh, we believe, Wampanoag woman. Again, it's never been written that she was Wampanoag, but she was from this area. And her granddaughter said she came from, I believe it was Harwich. Um, so more than likely, she was Wampanoag. Um, but she was from Harwich, as her granddaughter said. And then again, Cuffey Slocum, father, was from West Africa, most likely modern day Ghana. Um, but again, we don't know with 100% certainty. And so the objects in this case point to those two sides of his identity. On the left, we have a djembe drum, which my son was nice enough to uh, loan us for this exhibition. <laughs> he said, as long as I give him credit, I used to travel to West Africa for work. And so I picked up this drum and gave it to him and then said, oh, can I have that for my exhibit? <laughs> this is something that typically only men in West Africa use or, or play, uh, the djembe drum. And then a kente cloth, which of course during Cuffey Slocum's time was a very sacred cloth that wasn't for everyday use or everyday wear, but now it's, it's pretty common because it's a symbol of West African identity. On the right-hand sign, we have a mortar and pestle which again was specifically for Native American women to grind acorns, to grind nuts, things like that. 
And then in the back here, this basket, um, it's not a historic basket. It was actually made specifically for this exhibition. It was made by an Aquina Wampanoag descendant of the Cuffey family. So she's a descendant of Paul Cuffey's brother. Um, but she is a traditional Aquina Wampanoag artist um, and used traditional methods, traditional means of dyeing, traditional dyes, traditional fibers, et cetera, um, to make this basket for this exhibition. So it's a really special piece in our collection. The first thing that came to mind when I was asked to do a Paul Cuffey exhibition is how far ahead of his time he was in his thinking. And so within a couple of days, I had this, I had no objects. I was freaking out about that. Like, what am I gonna put on display? But I did have this panel in mind. All of the things that he thought about, that he pushed, that he advocated, that were so far ahead of his time, um, I think were really significant to point out here. And one of the things I, I, I like to do, though I change it up depending on the age of the visitor or the ages of the people in the group, is to argue whether these have even been fully realized yet today. So things like African American voting rights, which Paul Cuffey, and we have a document about that here, uh, Paul Cuffey was pushing for as early as 1780, or at least that's as early as we have documentation for it. Um, again, not fully legally realized until 1965. Some would argue with a lot of tactics that have gone on since then, it still hasn't been fully realized. Some, some African Americans are still very um, purposefully prevented from voting in certain areas of the country. But let's assume 1965 is correct. That would mean that 184 years passed between Paul Cuffey arguing for this with the Dartmouth selectmen and it coming to fruition. Same thing with Native American voting rights or even Native American citizenship. So Native Americans were not granted citizenship until 1924. And, here, and, and then after that, states could decide whether or not to allow Native Americans to vote. And so the last state to allow Native American voting, that didn't happen until 1957. And so 177 years, almost the same amount of time. Uh, abolition of slavery around the same time he was pushing for it. And the Emancipation Proclamation didn't happen for 83 years. Again, some might argue, and if you have a, a group of college you know, <laughs> students, you might say, is mass incarceration a form of slavery? Or you might even talk about the fact that slavery isn't exactly prohibited in the, in the Constitution, because there is that unless convicted of a crime, right? So if you read that amendment, it forbids slavery unless a person is convicted of a crime. School integration. Paul Cuffey probably had the first integrated school in the country. Again, we don't know for certain it was the first, but it's the first one we know of. And so that was established between 1798 and 1800. School integration wasn't law until 1954, 156 years later. And then finally, black nationalism, this idea that all African descended people in this country have ties to the continent of Africa, should promote an African identity. Now that shifted through time, what, what that actually means. But again, usually when you hear about black nationalism, Marcus Garvey is credited with that concept but he was saying it 103 years after Paul Cuffey. So again, really points to his revolutionary spirit, right? He's hearing all of this stuff about American identity and freedom and equality. That's the man ahead of his time. And, and to point to some of that, again, we've got his uh, father's bill of sale here, or sorry, yeah, his father's bill of sale. And then again, his, peti his petition to the Dartmouth selectmen. And what this actually says, you know, he was so bold as to say, if you make us pay taxes in this town, we need to be given the same rights as all of the white people in this town. Um, and, and because they weren't, uh, it, this was him, his brother, and a couple of other people in the town. They weren't given that right. They weren't given those rights, specifically the right to vote. So they decided they weren't gonna pay their taxes. And they were thrown in jail. <laughs> 
But because of that, a few years later, all free persons in the state of free men, sorry, all free men in the state of Massachusetts were given the right to vote. So we can't say that he directly, you know, was responsible for that, but I'm sure it contributed to that uh, being changed. Here in the middle um, is where I explain the, the shifts in where you see the two Fs and an E, just the two Fs without an E, the one F. Cuffy, again, is derived from the African day name Kofi, like Kofi Annan, right, from the UN. This is the name given to boys born on Friday. And so in West Africa, you were always given a name that indicates the date of your birth or the weather conditions during your birth, something tied to the timing of your birth, because that's significant in your life course, according to West Africans. And so, of course, as enslaved people were coming over here, some of those names were dropped and they were given Christian names. And some of those names were anglicized, so they look differently or they look the way a census taker thinks they should be spelled. And so that's why you have all of the variations of Cuffey. But we know that his father, when he signed his will, signed it C-U-F-E. So that's how he spelled his name. But Paul Cuffey didn't. He spelled it with the two Fs and an E most of the time. You can't talk about Cuffey or his abolitionism without talking about the fact that he was a Quaker. He states in a document, and I'm not, I'm, I don't remember which one, that he's not sure if his parents were formally Quakers, but that he knew they subscribed to the belief system. They may not have been because although Quakers believed in equality and that every person has the inner light of God uh, and that you know at some point they were all advocating, mostly advocating, I'm from Newport, there were plenty of Quakers who were like, I'll give up the faith before I give up my slaves. Um, but most were advocating the abolition of slavery. It was still very uncommon for a Native American or an African American to be formally adopted into the Society of Friends. Paul Cuffey was absolutely uh, an exception in this respect. And it may have had to do with the fact that he had lots and lots of money and paid for half of the construction of the new building in Westport. He was actually asked, he was the first African American that was asked to speak at the annual meeting in 1815. So he was pretty significant among Quakers. Um, and this absolutely guided his ideas about a free colony in Sierra Leone, uh, emancipation, and why slavery was immoral. And so we have to talk about his Quaker faith, but when I'm giving tours through this area, I'm very careful to put it in the context of the time. Yes, Quakers were absolutely pushing for the abolition of slavery, but it was still the late 18th, early 19th century. So it was not what we would consider today equality or integration by any means, right? A little bit about silhouettes. So these were a way, you know, at a time when portraiture was very expensive, these were a way that almost anyone, because they were inexpensive enough, almost anyone could capture themselves or a loved one for posterity. The reason that we say this is the only known image of Paul Cuffey uh, even though there are lots of paintings and, and images out there that say they are Paul Cuffey, Quakers generally did not get their portraits taken. They saw it as something that was vain. And also, much like we see with Islamic art, you're not supposed to try to do what God does. You're not supposed to try to replicate the human form. It's seen as sacrilegious. Now, some Quakers, like William Roach, absolutely had their portraits taken, right, because they were of a certain, certain class status, and they were like, I'm going to get a painting done of myself. We don't think or we don't know that Paul Cuffey did that. Um, so as far as we know, uh, there are two silhouettes of him. The one that we have here, and we actually have a copy of it down uh, in the kitchen, which, which is called Cuffey Kitchen, but I don't think the sign is, is out there anymore. Um, and a friend of his from Newport saw the silhouette and said, this looks just like him. 
this really captures uh, his face and his identity. So we wanted to point to <laughs> Paul Cuffey's entrepreneurial spirit and the fact that he was a merchant. He was the wealthiest man of color at the time uh, in the country. And so uh, really important to highlight his trade networks. He traded all down the East Coast into the Caribbean, London, West Africa. His primary idea, and we'll talk about it a little more when we talk about abolition, his primary idea, right, very pragmatic, was not we need to end slavery now. It was we need to replace trade in humans with trade in goods from West Africa. And it serves, that serves two purposes. It'll end slavery, but it'll also elevate West Africa so that it's on par with the United States and Europe economically. And so he sort of lived that in his life. And that, by the way, is why his stuff got confiscated. We'll, we'll talk about that a little later. These documents are our own. So we do have some documents uh, where Paul Cuffey is giving his accounts or writing about things he's doing in Sierra Leone. One of the most important things he ever wrote was this epistle here, an epistle on Sierra Leone, where he's talking about developing this new colony for free African Americans, because his idea was, one, African Americans will never be truly equal here. Two, we need to send industrious, hardworking people to West Africa to teach them the trades they've learned here so that Africa can, can profit and will be on par with the US and Europe. And so he wrote an epistle on that, talking about the conditions in Sierra Leone, and also it was sort of a call to free African Americans to move there and, and colonize, which was problematic in and of itself. But, um, so that's what this case is all about, sort of abolition and recolonization or repatriation. And so now we'll go back into uh, the gallery. On either side, of this case, I wanted to highlight seafaring since it was a, a really important, maybe one of the most important aspects of Paul Cuffey's life, and talk about the history of Native American seafaring and African American seafaring. The contexts were a little different, but if you think about whaling and seafaring, at this time, they were really the only integrated industries in the country. They were one of the only global industries in the country. And so we have to ask, why were they so integrated? Why did so many men of color engage in, in seafaring? For Native American men, if you think about the land being colonized, you can no longer seasonally travel around the landscape to get your food and resources. You're now stuck in one place. And so how do you make a living when you can't fish and hunt and go from place to place? You've got to engage in wage labor. You're not allowed to engage in most wage labor, but you're allowed to go to sea. And so as land bases were shrinking, more and more Native American men were going to sea. And before we updated the Culture of Whaling, Cultures of Whaling exhibit, uh, which we'll be going to next, we had a case dedicated to sort of mariners of color. And Paul Cuffey was one of them. Levi Cuff was another one. As I was working with Jonathan, who wrote this, he said, that's my great, great grandfather. And so we realized that even though we had these two images in the same case, we didn't realize that this was a relative of Paul Cuffey. And he was also the last person to use the last name Cuff that we know of um, in that particular family. But he identified as an Aquinawampanog. So one of the things I forgot to highlight as we were looking at that genealogical chart is the Cuffey family is this succession of Native American, African American intermarriage. And it happens throughout the generations. And so to this day, even though all Cuffey descendants know their history in their lineage, in their genealogy, some politically and socially assert a Native American identity. So there are Cuffey descendants who will say, I'm a Quinnawampanoag. That doesn't mean they're rejecting their African identity. It means that's their, that was their upbringing in those traditions. 
And on you know, the other side, we have Cuffey descendants who fully assert a, an African-American identity without rejecting the fact that they also have a Native American identity. Um, but African-American seafaring, similar circumstances, right? But again, when you think about the labor opportunities for free African-American men at this time, there weren't very many. Going to sea, was, it was dangerous, yes. It took you away from home for a long time, yes, but it was stable. And you were given some measure of respect. And so based on how well you did your work, you were given respect. You were paid mostly equally. Mm, not entirely, but it was your best shot at equal pay, at somewhat equal pay, right? Um, and so African Americans were also going to see. But here's something I would add to that, and, and again, this is why I stole this text from my own dissertation. One of the really cool things about being an African American seafarer is, good to see you. You go down the East Coast, you're in a port in Charleston, you're getting news about what's going on with African Americans in Charleston. You go to the Caribbean, you're seeing how your African traditions and spirituality and language is being maintained in the Caribbean. You go down to Brazil, same thing. And so you're really part of this diaspora, you're part of this network, and you're seeing places where other African descended people live and how they're holding on to, to, to traditions and maybe news about revolts. Right? and news about freedom, and news about what's going on in the community. Yeah, and so it was really this opportunity to get in touch with Africans around the world if you were on board ship. Now, of course, the first port I mentioned was Charleston, and that's where this comes in. Right? All mariners had to carry seamen's protection papers. Um, they were sort of like a passport back then, but had an additional value to African-American men. If we're in port in Charleston, the only way I have to prevent myself from being taken as a slave is this piece of paper. This asserts that I'm a free man, right? Didn't mean I got to roam around Charleston. African-American mariners who were in port in the South had to wait in jail until the ship went back out. But at least they weren't kidnapped and enslaved, right? So that's, that was the additional benefit of this for African-American men. This Siemens protection paper belonged to Michael Wehner, who was Paul Cuffey's brother-in-law. So Michael Wehner, um, who was likely also Wampanoag, married Paul Cuffey's oldest sister and was also his business partner for much of his life. And so we have his protection papers here. And then on the other side, we have a Senate report uh, there was a whole lot going on around 1812. We weren't supposed to be trading with the British. And so Paul Cuffey, bringing goods back from Sierra Leone, which was a British company, pulled into Newport and they took his ship because he violated the law by trading with, technically, the British right, in, in Sierra Leone. So in Newport, they held his cargo, they held his ship, they didn't want to release it. A lot of Paul Cuffey's influential friends wrote letters to President Madison, and that's when he got that sit-down meeting with President Madison. And Madison told the Newport officials to release his ship and his cargo because Paul Cuffey obviously meant no harm. Um, and so that's sort of the, the detailed version of that story. This map here, uh, which unfortunately I haven't updated yet because some scholars and, and family members have come in and said there are additional points that should be on this map. I mapped out all of the known places where Paul Cuffey traded or docked uh, or, or brought his ships or cargo. This is likely what Paul Cuffey's yard looked like. Um, so he did have a shipyard and you can see there's a, a Structure here, structure here, and then ships being built right on the coast. But we thought it would be really neat to show people the process of shipbuilding uh, during Paul Cuffey's time. And then there's this great local artist, Raymond Shaw, 
who uh, painted this watercolor, which is his vision of Cuffey's boatyard uh, along the Ecoxet River. Over uh, on the other side of the room, I talked about black nationalism and Paul Cuffey really being the father of black nationalism. And so I did a sort of timeline here of people who promoted the same kind of thinking after Paul Cuffey. And so we have Major Delaney, uh, who was a Civil War uh, major, who is quoted as saying, we are a nation within a nation, meaning African Americans. So we are Africa within the United States. We must go from our oppressors. So again, pushing that idea that people of African descent really need to go to Africa to realize their freedom. That was uh, you know, during the Civil War, so uh, mid 19th century. Then you have Marcus Garvey, our success educationally, industrially, and politically based upon the, is based upon the protection of a nation founded by ourselves. And the nation can be nowhere else but Africa. On the other side of this is, of course, Paul Cuffey's abolitionist ideals. And so he wanted to abolish the slave trade. But again, I think it's important to point out that it wasn't revolt. It wasn't overthrow the system immediately. It was, and of course, I'm putting it into modern lingo, do it in a way that's sustainable. Build up ourselves and our community and, and West Africa, and then slavery will no longer be a necessity. But again, he was in this system of capitalism where the ultimate goal is cheaper labor. You can't get any cheaper than free, right? So very difficult to promote those ideals and engage in the system itself. And then this case, of course, is also highlighting slavery during the time. Um, one book that was loaned to us by the Westport Historical Society, The Non-Slaveholder, I think this was like 30 years after Paul Cuffey's death, and he's still being you know, called out as the most important abolitionist in American history. Um, one of the, the final pieces we have is this uh, painting that was done in the 1990s. So again, there are a lot of portraits out there that claim to be Paul Cuffey. We don't know that any of them are. And so an artist uh, was commissioned to do this painting for Bridgewater State University. And this is totally based on the silhouette, but again, we don't know that that was his skin color. We don't know that that was all of his facial features, but this doesn't claim to be 